Okay, so some of you are probably aware of the hot mess that is trying to acquire games nowadays, which were originally published by Epic Mega Games in the 90s. Now, unlike the stuff put out by Apogee before and after they became 3D Realms, which is, for the most part, still all available from the 3D Realms website, or was otherwise made freeware and is available elsewhere, the approach Epic Mega Games took was to just release all the rights to what they published back to the authors of those games, which, for the most part, worked out well enough, as many DOS titles published by Epic are now freeware. But for the few games where the authors didn't really care to do anything with their software anymore, those can be incredibly difficult to acquire, especially today's ancient DOS game, Zone 66, as few copies exist out there which provide the full experience, as the game was originally separated into fragments, where you could buy the first half or second half separately, and eventually some boxed copies were put out as well, which each only contained two of the game's eight missions. And then on top of all of that, there was no guarantee you'd even have the Gravis ultrasound files, which are much higher fidelity than the standard Sound Blaster sound and music that's normally included. However, thanks to one particular fan of the show who took a chance on a purchase, I now have the full 8 mission experience, including the Gus files. So the ultimate question is, was it worth the effort? Is the fully registered and complete copy of Zone 66 as awesome of a game as the shareware version led us to believe? Nope. And don't get me wrong, it's still a really fun game to get started into, but the more you play, the more you realize that nothing really changes short of the difficulty constantly increasing every step of the way, until it gets to a point where you're pretty much forced to use only the most destructive ships, or die. Not to mention, the story is extremely detailed early into the game, but by the end it's pretty much devolved into, let's destroy stuff, followed by, here's a secret message showing you where to destroy stuff. Repeat until done. Zone 66 was developed primarily by a couple members of the Renaissance Demo Scene Group, and was published by Epic Mega Games in 1993. It's a one-player 2D shooter, with support for VGA 320x200 256 color graphics, and some fairly standard sound devices. Though it should be noted that the Gus music was not included with most copies of the game by default, and had to be downloaded separately from a BBS. Or at the time, you could also just order a cheap shareware disc of Zone 66 from Epic, and that would include the Gus music by default, since there was space for the files on said disc. As for its current release date though, it was never officially made freeware, and this is absolutely one of the harder games to get a legit complete copy of. Now before I go on, I do want to point out that given the game's demo scene roots, I absolutely would not be surprised if the game's authors were totally okay with it being shared around freely nowadays. And heck, if I ever hear from one of them that it's okay to do that, I'll absolutely post some links for everyone to grab a copy. But until that point in time, there is an alternative. But first, a little background as to why this is so hard to acquire complete. Many of the games which came out of Epic Mega Games were sold fragmented, whereby you didn't have to buy the games in their entirety, you could just buy a portion of the game and play that. Now, Apogee did this too, but I'm pretty sure this was more common with Epic stuff. Now, Zone 66 in particular has 8 missions, and originally you could either order missions 1 through 4 or missions 5 through 8. You did not have to buy the whole set altogether although you would save a few bucks if you did. Now later on, a third party came along who wanted to separate the game out even more, so you'll frequently see boxed sets which only include either missions 1 and 2 or missions 3 and 4. I think I might have seen a 5 and 6 box at one point, but if it exists it would be exceptionally rare, and the 7 and 8 box was never made or released as far as I know. However, if you want a legit copy of the full game nowadays, this is what you want to look out for. And the company responsible for this release is Romware, a German software distributor who put out a lot of Epic's titles in that part of the world. And so yes, this is the German version of the game. However, it's byte for byte identical to the English 1.0 release of the game, so there's no worries there. But more importantly, see this little circle up here? Yeah, guess what Vols translates to? That's right, full. 
This says that it's the full version of the game and it's absolutely right about that, including all eight missions and even the Gus data files so you can get the proper Gravis ultrasound music going. Now, I was told this particular purchase wasn't too expensive, but I've since looked for it and the only listing I found for one was over $100. And in fact, most physical copies of Zone 66, even freaking shareware copies, often demand a premium. But as proved by my having this now, it occasionally does show up for more sane prices. So if you want one and don't want to pay an insane amount, just keep your eyes peeled and be patient. Also, there's one other thing I want to quickly mention. And this is one of those games I pirated when I was much younger and didn't know any better, but I didn't get very far into it because in either the second or third mission, I forget which, there was a particular target you had to destroy to win, but which didn't actually show up in the game meaning it couldn't be destroyed, meaning you couldn't win the mission, meaning you couldn't progress the story without hacking the game's save data. I even grabbed the game from multiple other sources when I ran into that issue those many years ago, and all of them had this problem. Well, this full release of the game doesn't have this issue. Now mind you, it's version 1.0, and I know there's a version 1.5 out there, and I don't know if that's what makes the difference or not, but suffice to say, if you try to grab an illegit copy of this game, be prepared to run into that potential hiccup. As mentioned earlier, the story has an incredibly detailed and intriguing start, devolving into barely meaningful tripe by the end. The story takes place in a distant future where most of the world is ruled over by an organization known as the World Council, who maintains a peacekeeping military known as the Global Security Agency, or GSA. Now you play the role of an ex-GSA combat pilot who had retired to a fairly big city, married your girlfriend, and your first child was just born. Life seemed good. But then, a mysterious person requests to talk to you privately outside of the city, and when you meet him, he warns you to escape from the city as soon as possible, without telling you any reasons as to why. Now, Although difficult to trust at first, he shows you his GSA decorations, establishing him as one of the most well-respected and highest decorated officers out there. He also provides you with the coordinates of an abandoned flight hangar outside of the city, still filled with equipment, where he intends to meet you the next day to plan your escape. You race back to the city as fast as you can, and once it's in view, you realize something's very wrong, and then watch as something descends at high speed from the sky before... Yeah, that just happened. Your city literally gets nuked off the face of the planet. This sets off a chain of events in the story dealing with treachery, splinter groups, oil shortages, and a desire to solve the world's downplayed energy crisis by eliminating its biggest energy users i.e. entire cities. At least, for the first few missions. Again, by the time you reach the last half of the game, there's very little more story provided to the player. In fact, here, I'll spoil the ending for you. Seriously, this is it. When you beat the game properly, all you get is this half screen of text which barely sums up much of anything. This is your reward for the six to eight hours it takes to beat this thing. I know DOS games are notorious for having the weakest endings, but yeesh. And yes, I'm aware the games I've made in the past don't fare much better, if at all. I'm not giving myself a free pass on that either. So before we talk about the gameplay, there's a couple interesting things of note that I need to point out. The first is that, because this game was made by demo scene coders, it actually comes with its own trainer cheats. From the options menu, you can turn on invulnerability, infinite fuel, infinite missiles, or infinite bombs, either all at once or specific ones that you want to have. Though it's important to note that the story segments won't run if you have any cheats enabled, just in case you want to unlock all the story segments, which is done by playing and beating the missions in order with the cheats off. The other thing I want to point out quickly is that this game doesn't appear to run very well at first glance, as it's locked to one-fifth of the standard vertical retrace rate for VGA 320x200, which translates to only 14 frames per second. However, this game was designed to run just like this, on computers as slow as 16 MHz. Not 6-0, 1-6, which to put that in perspective, getting a game to refresh a full screen of 256 color graphics on hardware that slow without absolutely destroying the frame rate is pretty much next to impossible. So the fact that this game pulls it off is impressive in its own right. 
One thing that's really neat too is that the game's demo mode isn't your typical demo mode which just shows raw gameplay. The demo mode here actually demonstrates how the game is played, along with all of its features, giving you text messages to describe everything in proper detail. The only reason you would need to read the instructions after watching this is to learn the controls. Now let's talk about how to play this thing. Each mission has a singular objective, destroy all marked targets. Now every target you must destroy to win is marked in white, and as you can see, yeah, a lot of things are marked in white. The red dots are emplacements which will attack you from the ground, while green dots are launch pads for enemy fighters which don't need to be destroyed but you probably should to make your job easier, while yellow dots on your radar are enemy fighters which can only spawn in from nearby launch pads and only when the number of fighters nearby is below a certain threshold. To accomplish your missions, you need to use the various ships provided to you. And chances are you'll want to stick with your own ships, but you also have the option of using the enemy ships, though there's not really much of a reason to do so. I mean, it's neat that you can, but most of the enemy ships have stats which aren't as good. Now in order, the stats you have to keep track of are Armor, which is effectively your health, Top Speed, which is how fast you can go, Acceleration, which is how quickly you can accelerate or decelerate, Turning, which is how fast you can turn, Engines, which doesn't appear to be anything more than aesthetic. Fuel capacity, which is how long you can fly for, plus your special devices tie into your fuel. Your payload space, which is used to load in bombs and missiles. And your guns, which are used to take out the enemy ships. Once you select your ship, you need to arm it with ordinances. Now each missile or standard bomb takes up a single spot of payload space. And cluster bombs take up two spots, but can destroy up to four tiles at a time. Firebombs take up four slots and blast several targets in a row, though I find they're very difficult to aim properly, though it's not worth the space. And then each mega bomb takes up ten slots, but has a blast which can often take out around a dozen tiles at a time, sometimes more. But generally speaking, you want to be using cluster bombs or mega bombs. The missiles home in on enemy aircraft and are essential given their high damage output, not to mention scaring tailing enemies into veering off, so it's important to always have a few on hand. Piloting your ship takes a bit of practice, but it's not too difficult to get the hang of, as you have controls to turn clockwise or counterclockwise, and can accelerate or decelerate as though you were in an airplane. I know it seems like these are supposed to be aircraft, but one of the later missions takes place in Earth orbit, so these things are clearly more than just mere airplanes, and that's why the game constantly refers to them as ships. Basically, each mission comes down to taking off from a launch pad, doing a run on some enemy targets, and then returning to a launch pad. To land, you simply touch a launch pad while at minimum throttle, at which point you can either reload, repair, and immediately take off again, adjust your armaments, or select a different ship entirely. Now, one thing I should point out is that you technically have infinite continues. If you get shot down, you can keep playing the mission as though nothing happened, with one exception. Your score is reset to zero. Now, this isn't actually all that terrible, as the high score system isn't really done all that well, as it's shared between all eight missions, instead of having separate high score tables for each mission. Not to mention, if you do die and use a continue, the score you ultimately get to place in the high scores table is the highest score you achieve. So, if you manage to go for two thirds of a mission without dying, then suddenly get shot down, it kind of de-incentivizes playing the game the way it was intended, and you sort of stop caring if you get shot down or not, since it becomes impossible to improve upon your score, and now you're just trying to get the mission won so that you can move on. And yeah, remember how loaded the map was at the start of the mission? It can take up to an hour to play a single mission of this, and in the later missions the difficulty factor is so high up there, even with the settings reduced in the game's options, that you just don't get a break. The game really wears you out when you play it, and I think part of it does come down to the frame rate and wrestling with the controls. For instance, I mentioned the cluster bombs can destroy four tiles at a time. Well, this depends on exactly where you drop them, since if you manage to drop a cluster bomb dead center in the middle of a tile, it will only hit that tile. To get the full effect, you have to drop them in the corner of a tile so that it can hit all the tiles which share that corner. This level of precision is difficult to achieve when everything's moving very fast and everything you do in terms of turning and accelerating happens in large steps as opposed to smoothly. You do have a couple extra devices to help you survive though, which are cycled to in your bomb listing. Shadow Mode and Escape Mode. Shadow Mode consumes a portion of your fuel to make you completely invulnerable for a few seconds, and it is essential to get used to using this for taking out enemy emplacements. 
Escape mode, on the other hand, consumes a burst of fuel to produce an incredible amount of speed for a few seconds, allowing you to get out of a nasty situation or just cross large portions of the map faster. You have to be careful with the escape mode though, since you cannot slow down from it until it expires. Meaning, if you're trying to get to a nearby launch pad to land, it may be better to aim for one that's further away so as not to give the enemy ships chasing you time to catch up. This highlights one of the more annoying problems I ran into in that you cycle between your bombs and modes so often that you very frequently use things that you didn't mean to and can end up burning a ton of fuel because you ran out of bombs and auto cycled the shadow mode or accidentally engaged escape mode when you were trying to cycle the bombs after engaging shadow mode or drop the wrong kinds of bombs if you decide to load different kinds at a time. It's kind of a mess since you only have one button to cycle the active ordnance. It would have been nice to have separate keys for the shadow and escape modes, though I understand it was done this way it was for better compatibility with the Gravis gamepad and to keep the controls from becoming too convoluted. Actually, while we're on the topic of things I would have done differently, there's one feature I'm very surprised was never put into the game. So, as mentioned earlier, you not only have a selection of proper ships to fly, but you can also fly the enemy ships. But even the instructions tell you that there's not really a good reason to do so, since the enemy ships are underpowered by comparison. But, what could have made it very desirable to fly the enemy ships would be if it lets you blend in with the other enemies, preventing them from attacking you until you damaged or bombed an enemy ship or installation, at which point they would continue to attack you until the next time you landed. Having a simple feature like that would have added incentive to use enemy ships for sneak attacks or on small bases, or to get from one launch pad to another without attracting attention. Heck, even back when I first played this game as a kid, I wondered why this wasn't a thing you could do. That said, you can always just use the cheats to screw with everything. And see this little pipsqueak ship right here? It has the worst stats by far of any ship in the game. Yet, if we go turn on all the cheats, it suddenly becomes a harbinger of death and destruction. Now, I don't really have too much more to say about the game, but I did want to take this opportunity to answer a question I've had about this thing for a while, and that's, how much damage do all the weapons do? I mean, missiles obviously do a lot of damage and have the secondary effect of homing in on enemies, so their DPS isn't really a concern. You're going to use them. But what about all the other weapons? I mean, the phasers and lasers seem pretty similar, while the particle guns seem like they might be more powerful, but is it worth the drop in firing rate? And then what about the machine guns? They fire every single frame of gameplay, but how much damage are they really doing? Well, I did some testing and figured it all out. Machine guns may fire once per frame, but they only do 0.25 points of damage, so they have an effective DPS of 3.5 per second. In fact, based on this, it's safe to say that internally, the armor values are being calculated and processed four times higher than what the player is being told. The lasers fire once every four frames and do a single full point of damage, so they actually match the DPS of the machine guns at 3.5 per second. The phasers fire once every five frames, but do a point and a half of damage each, so a single phaser is able to do 4.2 damage per second. Lastly, the particle guns only have a firing rate of once every 8 frames, but do 2.5 damage per hit, thus they have an effective DPS of 4.375, slightly higher than the phasers. Armed with this knowledge, I decided to match these numbers up with the weapons of all the ships in the game, and came up with the following table showing the maximum attainable DPS of each ship, provided all of their shots are impacting. This kind of explains why the last two missions in the game have such an insane level of difficulty, given that the enemy ships there are, for the most part, stronger against airborne targets than most of what you have available for yourself. Yet, because their ground attack capabilities and armor are lacking, you wouldn't really want to fly them anyways. And it's kind of pathetic just how weak most of the main player ships are for air-to-air -air combat compared to these later enemy ships, with a few notable exceptions, which ironically end up being the only ships you ever want to fly in the final missions, as you wouldn't really stand a chance otherwise. I've got so many mixed feelings about this one. I was really looking forward to playing through the full game for real, getting to see where the story would take me, only to end up disappointed by the end since the game gets worse instead of better the longer you play it for. Which is a shame because it starts out so very strong. And yet, there's never really been any games since Zone 66 which capture the same feel or style of gameplay. Now, this is a game which was limited only by its target hardware and the time available to make it, and I know it could have been so much more with more work and more powerful systems to drive its engine. 
I've even come up with several ideas for a spiritual successor to this game myself, despite never owning the full game or even playing through and beating the full game until recently, because that first mission in the shareware version truly shines and really highlights what this game could have been. It really bugs me that it devolves into a chaotic and exceedingly difficult mess by the end. So much so that I'm really, really considering making one of those ideas of mine, so that we can have a more modernized Zone 66 experience. All of that said, having the extra ships available with the full game does help to keep it fresh longer, and it really is only the second half of the game that turns into a difficult mess, as the first half is perfectly enjoyable. Really, what I'm trying to say is that Zone 66 is fun to start, frustrating to finish, and if you want more than what the single mission shareware version provides, then yeah, go get the full game, because even though you probably won't see it through to the end, you will get more out of it than just playing the shareware version. But no, it's not worth spending a hundred bucks on an overpriced copy. So something I need to mention right now that's extremely pertinent about this game is that it has its own built-in protected mode memory handler, which does virtually the same thing the HiMem.sys file would normally do. Meaning, this game cannot run if DOS has its default extended memory handling enabled. And this is one of the few DOS games made in the 90s where you pretty much were required to make either a boot disk or a separate startup menu to handle its unique startup requirements. Thus, in DOSBox, the way you set this up is to go through each of the memory settings and set all of them to false. Remember, this doesn't disable the emulation of these things in DOSBox, it just disables the emulation of the DOS system level handling of these things. Also, even though the game seems to run just fine with the auto cycles count, it really doesn't need the level of cycles it wants to chew up to run its best, so setting a fixed cycles count of 30,000 seems to be the better approach, which is still way higher than the game needs, but ensures that the speed of the game remains constant and stable. You'll probably also want to use the gust sound in music if it's available with your copy, in which case you'll want to turn off the sound blaster support and turn on the gust support. Also, one last thing of note, if you try to run this game on real hardware that's even just slightly more powerful than a 486, chances are the game will crash and reboot the system. Now, This is actually a problem with the game's audio auto detection routines, so if this happens to you on real hardware, just make sure you manually tell it what sound drivers to use when you start it, as there's various command line parameters for each of its supported sound drivers, and you should be fine. Anywho, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Next up will be an ADG mod video coming out on Saturday, August 1st, and we're going to be doing some level editing with a game which, quite frankly, should have come with a level editor, all things considered. So be sure to stay tuned to see what game we're going to be messing around with. Thanks for watching, everyone, and extra special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small random set of you guys.